Chapter 52 Discrimination Leviticus 21, 16 to 24. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seeds in their generations that hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach. A blind man, or a lame, or he that hath a flat nose, or anything superfluous, or a man that is broken-footed, or broken-handed, or crook-backed, or a dwarf, or that hath a blemish in his eye, or be scurvy, or scabbed, or hath his stones broken. No man that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron the priest shall come nigh to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire. He hath a blemish. He shall not come nigh to offer the bread of his God. He shall eat the bread of his God, both of the most holy and of the holy. Only he shall not go in unto the veil, nor come nigh unto the altar, because he hath a blemish, that he profane not my sanctuaries, for I the Lord do sanctify them. And Moses told it unto Aaron and to his sons, and unto all the children of Israel. Leviticus 21, 16 to 24. In very recent years, these regulations have angered many people, and some cite them as instances of the primitivism of the Old Testament. Just as many peoples, including some of the Greeks, exposed or killed their defective children, so too the primitive Hebrews discriminated against the handicapped. This is strange criticism coming from a generation which has a policy of aborting an unborn child if its tests declare it to be of the unwanted sex, as well as when it is defective. The fact is that biblical law legislates against all mistreatment of helpless or handicapped peoples, as we have seen. The difference between the modern view and that of God's law is this. The modern view is both sentimental and cruel. As Proverbs 12.10 tells us, The tender mercies of the wicked are cruel, God's law is not sentimental, but it is loving and caring of the weak, of the disabled, and of widows and orphans. What happens when this law is disregarded? The religious vocation becomes a dumping ground for the unwanted and handicapped persons. It is not surprising that, in more than a few religions, a religious vocation is barred to all such people. In some denominations the same policy once prevailed in other spheres. The cast-off mistress of local lords and noblemen were in some countries given to the clergy of the established church to marry, and the clergy could not marry without permission. In the United States the pastor's family clothed itself with cast-off clothing given by members, and the house was furnished with cast-off furniture. All this is insulting to God, hence these laws. The flat nose refers to a slit or a broken nose. A blemish in the eye covers a variety of serious eye defects. The disabled member of the priestly line, however, is entitled to live off the receipts of the sanctuary. Verse 22. There is thus no unkindness to such people. Only the perfect specimen belongs to God, either as priest or as sacrifice. Thus, as we have seen, no blemished offering could be given, Exodus 12.5, etc., Leviticus 1.3, etc., Deuteronomy 17.1, etc. Christ is the unblemished Lamb of God, 1 Peter 1.19. Both the sacrifice which typified him as well as the priest who represented him had to be without blemish. He works also to make his church blemish-free, Ephesians 5.27. There is here an important distinction which must be made. There is a difference between blemish and infirmities on the one hand and sin on the other. Men now are rational about physical defects. They demand special privileges for them, but won't then get out of sight. Sin they can tolerate. Physical defects upset them badly. 
Sin excludes men from God. Infirmities do not. This is the biblical perspective. Castrated men were also barred from membership in the congregation, Deuteronomy 23.1. This did not bar them from worship nor from salvation. Membership was in terms of families and the heads of households. Men were members and potential captains or elders over 10 families, 50, 100 or 1,000, Deuteronomy 1, 9 to 18. Membership was in terms of married men. The clergy were to command respect for God, for the faith and for the sanctuary. Thus, they had to be whole men. The wholeness had to be physical and religious because anything else would bring dishonour to God. This law has had a grim history. Within the Roman Empire, in terms of persecution, the clergy were at times castrated. The Romans were aware of biblical law at this point and in fact required wholeness of their priests. Canon I of the First Council of Nicaea held that any clergy member castrated by the barbarians could not be distinguished. He had entered the ministry a whole man. Canon 21 of the Apostolic Canons said that such a mutilation at the hands of the enemies of Christ did not debar a man from being made a bishop. In this century, mutilations of the clergy have taken place on a greater scale than ever before by Turks and by Marxists. The Russian and Spanish revolutions were especially savage in this respect. Calvin, discussing this text, said, The analogy must be kept in view between the external figures and the spiritual perfection which existed only in Christ. The perfect holiness of Christ is to become our holiness in heaven. Just as we conform ourselves to him, so we must work to bring about a conformity of physical and spiritual wholeness. This calls for medical study and work towards the physical aspects of that wholeness. In some cults, most notably in the worship of the Phrygian Sibeli, physical mutilations, especially castration, were aspects of the highest holiness. In modern medicine, too often a contempt is shown for God's handiwork, the body of man, As against this, we are required by God to seek the holiness of our total being as our necessary task. It is worthy of note that, in ancient Israel, all the priests had to undergo physical examinations and tests to prove their wholeness. To a limited degree, this is still a requirement by some churches. The law of Leviticus 21, 16-24 is, as has been noted, now resented as discriminatory. This should not surprise us. We have seen in the 1980s a refusal to quarantine or in any way discriminate against carriers of AIDS, a deadly disease. Together with that, there have been laws passed to prevent any discrimination against homosexuality. At the same time, The Bible and prayer are banned from state schools, while various evils are protected. Discrimination is inescapable. Life is a process of discrimination, of choosing, accepting and rejecting. If our premises of discrimination are not from God, they will be evil.